There was a husband and wife that went to Israel for a three-week vacation, a tour of the Holy Land. They really enjoyed themselves, and they brought the, the, they brought the mother-in-law. The son-in-law brought the mother-in-law with them. As the three of them went for three weeks, and they had little challenges between the mother-in-law and the father-in-law. And unfortunate circumstance, the mother-in-law passed away the day before they were about to come back to the United States. And so they went down to the funeral home, and uh, the funeral home director said, Here, here's your two options. You know, we can bury your mother-in-law right here in the Holy Land for $150. I mean, that's amazing. Or we can fly her back for $20,000. There's taxes, there's customs, all that stuff to get them over. And the son-in-law thought about it and says, nope, we'll leave her right here. Oh, no, we're bringing her back. We'll bring her back. He goes, that's $20,000. He says, yeah, we're we're bringing her back. He goes, well, why? You you know, you can do it for $150 right here. He goes, listen, I don't know too much about the Holy Land or the Bible, but I did hear about 2,000 years ago, there was a guy that died around here and after three days rose from the grave and I'm not taking any chances. (laughs) I just want to say to my mother-in-law, I love you, I love you, I love you. Let me just say that one more time. I love my mother-in-law, Greg Hubbard. This is Easter Sunday, or more people would call it Resurrection Sunday. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. You say, why? we're in a sermon series called Passion, where we talked two weeks ago about the blood of Jesus and the cross. Today we're talking about the grave and the resurrection. Next week, if you've never seen a water baptism, a Christian water baptism, people going down to the water, coming back, we're going to do that in both of our services next week. You say, why did... Jesus do that? Why did God send his son Jesus to die on the cross, to go in the grave and come back up out of the grave? Why did, even if you don't know the Bible, I'm going to tell you really quickly why, because God loves you. God has a plan for your life, and it was the only way for God to deal with sin because he's a holy God. But the Bible says that God did that for everybody, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life, the Bible says. So Easter is really about hope. It's about life. It's about second chances. It's about a fresh start. And maybe you've come here looking for answers or hope or encouragement. You come to the right place. It's a, it's a new season. And I know what you're thinking. Okay, COVID's over. It's, I think the winter's over. It's now kind of springtime and You come outside and for the next month, you're gonna see a film of little green stuff all on your hood. I have a word for you. No pollen formed against me shall prosper. (laughs) Claritin 3 verse 16, come on somebody. It's a new season, it's a new season for our church. A year ago today, because of the generosity of people like you, over $115,000 was given to the wonderful people in Newark, Valesburg Assembly of God. That church was about to go under, it was over. And with resurrection, grace and power and mercy and the the greatness of the people of this church, they gave not just money, but time and resources and did a bunch of work days, reestablished that whole church. And a year ago today, matter of fact, tonight at four o'clock, we're gonna celebrate the one year anniversary of one church in two locations. And I wanna say thank you. Easter is about fresh starts. It's about the grace of God, forgiveness and hope and healing. But it is through the backdrop that we do live in a world full of problems and tension, anger and injustice, sin everywhere, death in the grave. And I just want to walk us through, first in the Old Testament, then the New Testament, then today, the grave. First, the grave in the Old Testament, Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you'll die. That's where death came in. That's where the grave came in. In Genesis chapter three, it was the great fall of mankind. You see, God made Adam and Eve perfect. He made them to live forever forever. The Bible says they were naked and not ashamed. They didn't have fights. There was no violence. There was a beauty. There was a life, an eternal life. It's what we we long for in our souls even today. But when they ate from that fruit, the Bible says sin came in and it was a physical death. They died. It was also a spiritual death, a disconnect from God, 
like a divorce, if you will, and then ultimately eternal death. So sin is bad. Now, during COVID, I don't know if you know this, but one of the main Google searches was question like this. Why does God allow suffering? Or why does bad things, or why do bad things happen to good people? If God is so good, why so many problems of injustice? Why cancer? My mom, she's on hospice today, she's Parkinson's, probably the most righteous person, served God, one of the most perfect, I never really even saw my mom sin, really. You say, she's a good person, why do we have problems like that? Or why does somebody get locked up for something they don't, they don't do wrong? Why doesn't God prevent accidents? Or like 9-11, there's an airplane. Why didn't God just snatch that plane out of the sky? My general thought is that God does prevent a lot of evil in the world, but there is a reality that most people will look on Google or they'll have a question and they'll place blame on God and not the real source. If your worldview is that God is not good, I just wanna correct it real quick. God's nature and character is good, but we live in a broken, sinful world, and God comes to make a change in the world. He does care about it. Now listen, if you're hurting and broken today, maybe your marriage or your situation, or maybe your kids are just kind of like not doing the right thing, or you lost your job, or you're just hurting, you've gone through a divorce, there's something not right. I do believe that God is a God that cares deeply. And if you'll bring your problems and your pain to God, I believe that he can heal you. But even if you're frustrated or angry, talk to God. The psalmist said this in in Psalm 42, nine, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning? So human beings do have problems. Even if you're a Christian, you put your faith in God, you might be saying to yourself, where's God right now? Some people in their pain, they push God away and they say, why does God allow this to happen? He he can't be good. But even if you don't know all the circumstances in life, God still is good. But instead of putting the blame on God, I suggest we put it on Satan. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the one that's lying. He's the one that's destroying lives. I suggest to you that you and I, when we hurt and we have pain and suffering, we look to Jesus Christ on the cross and he suffered in his shame. God is now taking action. He went to the cross, he died, he rose again. He is our savior, he is our help. So even if we're hurting and broken today, run to Jesus. It makes sense when you focus in on Jesus. The world does not make sense. He said, I need internal, emotional, my mental state. By his stripes, the Bible says we are healed. But the, the worldview of, the Bible worldview is that there's a broken world. The Bible says there's none of us that have good hearts. We're all broken people. We were born into it. Our ancestors brought us into it. But life in the Old Testament was different than it is now. Look what it says about how long people lived, but then they all died. When Adam was 130 years old, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived 193 years and then he died. Then Seth had lived uh, 115 years, he became the father of Enosh. After he became the father of Enosh, he lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years and then he died. Before like the flood or whatever that time, the Bible goes on to say in Genesis chapter six that the spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years old. So they used to live 800, 900 years. Does anyone know who lived the longest of all time? This is a Jeopardy question. Methuselah, 969 years, oldest man. But the Bible says that he died. God shortened the life to 120. The book of Psalms says 70 or 80 years. In America, the lifespan is 78 years. That's the average. Women, you live older, 81 years. Men, you live 71. You know why men die earlier? Let me show you a picture. This is one of the reasons. Right here, this is it. But I want to suggest to you that every king, every president, every celebrity, every influencer, 
If you go back to their grave, especially in the Old Testament, you can still see their body there. When sin came in, there was a finality towards the reality. We go back and we say, yes, sin is part of it. We can't blame God for everything. God is part of the solution. God is good. And he's here to help make a difference in the world. So we kind of fast forward to the time of Jesus. And there is one grave that's different than every other grave. It's the grave in the New Testament. It's Jesus's grave on this day, some 2000 plus years ago, after the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. Let, let me say it loud, let me say it clear. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Let me say it one more time. He's not here. It's like no other grave. I mean, you've had people pass away in your life. You've gone to funerals, graveside, church funerals, Catholic masses, whatever you know it's true. But what Jesus is different, after three days in the grave, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, came up out of the grave and they said it loud and clear, he's not here, he's risen just as he said. So if God can do that, what else can he not do? You come here and like most people, you're depressed and you're discouraged. You're confused. Maybe your life has changed. It's called, in America, it's called the great resignation. Statistics tell us now that 50% of Americans have changed their occupation or retired or did something different than they did two years ago. There's all this movement and all these things happening and maybe you're wobbly in your own faith but the centerpiece of the faith of the Christian person is not just the cross, but three days later, Christ rose from the grave. And if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is our faith. Have you ever thought about this? What would have happened if Jesus didn't rise from the grave? We almost make the assumption. We almost change it from resurrection to Easter. We almost kind of get rid of it like, hey, what are you doing after church for your lunch? or a picture, or dress in pastel colors, and all that stuff is wonderful, but the whole life of the Christian is based on not the cross, per se. A lot of good men, men have, people have died, but it's the resurrection, and if God could bring his own son up out of the grave with resurrection power, then that resurrection power may be still available today, and he could resurrect your marriage. He could resurrect your dream. He can bring your dead son back to life. I mean, he's away. God can bring him back. What God cannot do. So matter of fact, the Easter story is really not about death. We preach about the grave. It's about life. Jesus came to life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He comes to give you life. He comes to give you answers, solutions by faith. But if Jesus didn't come back to life, that means he lied. 14 times Jesus said that he was going to suffer go the way of the cross, even when his own disciples said, don't do it. That means we're, Jesus is a liar. That means the Bible isn't true. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, John chapter 10, that means that's not true. That means we're the most foolish people on the planet. Why would we come here today? Fill out connection cards, drop off kids, run around the soccer field. Shouldn't we eat, drink, and be merry? I mean, there is a sense that to follow Jesus, you have to die to yourself so Christ can live inside of us. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. I sense him, I feel him. But there is a sense that I have to go the way of the grave. It's no longer I who lives. There must be a death inside of me so Christ can live. But if Jesus did get out of the grave, it's the foundation of our faith. So it's not what Christ did for us, but it's why, because he has a plan and a purpose for our life. And for nothing else, for nothing else, you and I would be stuck in our sin right here. For no other reason. Because sin does something for us. It loses us of our peace. Our conscience is not clear. Have you ever done something wrong and it bothered you? Why? It's the conscience. You could say everything's okay, but you and, you and I know it's not okay. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but God comes and he gives the gift of eternal life that's found in Christ Jesus. So Easter's about life. 
And maybe you haven't heard anybody tell you today that how much God loves you. He cares about you and your, your life matters to God. Whether you know this or not, he formed you in the womb. He made you a man or a woman. Even if your family, maybe you kind of grew up in a dysfunctional home, maybe you didn't have all the information, the best education. Maybe you're a hurting, a broken person, things aren't fair. You weren't wealthy. All this stuff, God says, I, I, I got it. And I got you because I came up out of the grave. I can make a difference in your life. So finally, isn't that a great thing to hear finally from a pastor? I'm going to tell you a quick story. I wasn't planning it, but <laughs> I've got time. There was this young preacher, and he was all pumped up about the things of God, and he would just preach too long. He preached like two or three hour messages, and he got married, and his wife's like, honey, listen, I love you. You do a good job, but you got to shorten that sermon a little bit. And so she gave him a mint. She go, put that in the back of your mouth. When that wears down, that's your time to finish the message. Guy comes up, the whole bit. So he did that for a couple of years. One day he got a brand new suit. And in that suit, you know, sometimes men, when you get a new suit, they have those little spare uh, buttons. He, he popped that spare button and he thought it was a minute. He popped that in. That young preacher, he's still preaching the same message today, my friends. The grave in the Old Testament, the grave, excuse me, the grave in the Old Testament, the grave in the New Testament, the grave today. For the unbeliever and the believer in Christ, it's two different types of graves. For the unbeliever, you might say, maybe you just came to church today. Someone invited you. By the way, we're glad you're here. But you never even thought about it. You say, okay, if I die, I just, like Jehovah Witnesses, they believe you just go into the ground. No afterlife. You just go, you just go into the ground. Or maybe you're young. You say, I never even thought about it. I'm just kind of trying to get my career going. And, or maybe you just don't know. Like if you died, you wouldn't even know. Jesus actually went to the cross, even if you don't, he went to the cross to die for you. But for the believer, death is not a big deal for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. So as soon as a believer dies, he's in a moment, his soul goes directly up to heaven and we stand on the promise of God. If we learned anything during COVID is that we just don't know and we don't trust anything. No disrespect, but I don't trust any politician. I don't trust the economy. I don't trust the gas prices. They said, you can't even trust what's coming out of you know, what, with Russia or what, what's happening. They say the news, by the time it hits your ears, is so convoluted, you don't even know what you're hearing is true. The only thing that we have found over the last two years through experience is the truthfulness of God's word. Jesus Christ died and he rose again and he's coming back. And that's what we land on. We have heard. We have heard the Lord speak to us through messages, through his spirit, through the word of God, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I wanted to say that to you again. Even if your mom or your dad or somebody, a coach or some, they betrayed you. Even if anybody, everybody has cursed you, lied to you, stolen from you, the Lord has been good and he will never leave you nor forsake us. He's told us that he will build his church. He told us, it's not that I have this, like, this great revelation. If anything, I'm telling you, I don't know everything that's going on. The Bible tells us, don't even try to figure it out. Just walk by faith and not by sight. And what he just invites us to do is come follow him. It's actually the safest, more, most God-willed thing for you to do. Say, Lord, I don't get it all. I don't have all the details, but you did come up out of the grave and you just say, come follow me. And what happens is God said to us, I'll build my church during COVID. Do you know what the supply chain has been like over the last year? Do you know what the prices of, of steel and PVC and all that stuff up there? And we heard, our church heard the Lord's voice. I will build my church. So this pastor with a cool bomber jacket from H&M, <laughs> come on somebody. He's trying to figure this out like, 
Yeah, but God, like, you know, there's a lot of details here. I'm, I'm telling God, God, there's a supply chain problem and the prices have gone up and the average church in America is still only 50%. Do we even need it? How are we gonna get the money? And you know what I said? Don't forget, it's my church. I will build my church. I'm the savior. It's my blood. They're my people. I want you just to trust me. Valesburg was in trouble. And listen, when I left Newark 14 years ago, I, I left it to Jermel. He's the one that kind of messed it up behind me. I'm just joking. <laughs> Sorry, Jermel. Welcome back from Sri Lanka. We're glad you're here. But churches have gone through difficult times. The average church in America, they say to Barna, he's a statistician, he said 50% of pastors want to quit. I think most people want to quit. They're tired. You might have quit. You might have been gone for two years. And you're kind of coming back. You say, I, I have nothing. I've been listening on my, like, a, like working out or whatever. I've been listening to, there's a church out on the West Coast. You may or may not heard about it. It was called the rise and fall of a certain church, big popular church, and something happened with the pastor. And all these campuses, like 15 campuses, the whole church was a mess. And all these people needed to get healed and restored and touched. They said, the only thing we had to keep doing is focusing our attention on Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're still there. You say, where's Jesus? He said, God's right hand throne. Not only did he rise from the grave, the Bible says he ascended and he's at God's right hand throne. We just gotta keep our eyes focused on Jesus. I wasn't looking for a project in Newark, New Jersey. I had my own problems down here. The Lord said, follow me. I said, Lord, how much is this gonna cost? No real budget, just follow me. Lord, I don't know everything. I've been gone for 14 years. I'm different. Everything's different now. Jesus said, just come follow me. The generous people of our church, I guess you followed me. We followed Christ. We followed Christ. We did it together. Great leadership. Work days, extreme church makeover. Pastor George is sitting up here preaching. He was the best. He, that was the best message I heard him preach on Friday night. He was just talking about God's love, how God can do it. I'm just saying, God, thank you. You know, you just tell us to follow you. I didn't save a church. You didn't save a church. Jesus saved a church. It's his church. The sanctuary expansion, I'm kind of curious to know how it's going to go. I, how's it going to figure out what's going to look like? MCA, the music, the preaching, all this stuff. How's it going to go? Jesus said, just come follow me. It's my church. I'll build my church. Actually, Big Sky Enterprises is building it. If there's any problem, it's their fault. If everything else is good, it's Jesus' glory. Yeah, come on, somebody. We hang on the promises. He'll never leave us. He'll fill us with his Holy Spirit. Acts chapter one, verse eight, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit. I believe we're, we're coming to, that's a drop call. We're, we're, we're expanding. Sorry. Lord, help that preacher. I believe we're gonna experience a great move of the Holy Spirit. If we are indeed in the last days, God said, I'm gonna pour out my Holy Spirit. I think some of us just need resurrection power to come and just lift us and encourage us just to follow Jesus, he'll build it. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? For a believer, when we die, we believe we're gonna go to heaven, we're gonna be reunited. For the unbeliever, they're scared to death. What's gonna happen to me? You don't have to be scared to death. The Bible says once to live, then to die, then to judgment. When you stand before a God, you can stand before God with all the sin upon you or you can let God's love and his blood cover you. So when God sees you, he doesn't see you and your sinfulness. He sees Jesus and his righteousness and his holiness and his blood can cover over you. And you can have full assurance that when you die, you will be with the Lord forever. So you say, what do I need to do? ABC, accept that Jesus died on the cross, believe and confess or repent. Listen, God will take nine steps towards you He'll just love you. To the day you die, he's gonna go after you. He's gonna tell you how much he loves you. He has got a plan for you. You cannot build, have the sin upon you. You can't take it off. You're not a good person. You need Jesus. Let him wash you. Let him cleanse you. Give him your life. Follow him. He's gonna yell at you. He's gonna do it creatively. He's gonna do it through love. He's gonna do it however he's gonna get you. But you gotta take the next step. So for the unbeliever, maybe you're here today, you need to lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I need Jesus. 
or you need to run to this altar, I need Jesus. You need to get in your car, go home, say, I need the Lord, I need, I need Jesus. But there's a second group of people you're hurting today. You're a believer. COVID's been hard. The statistics are not good. Pornography is like 80% more than pre-COVID. Domestic abuse. People have acted wild and crazy. Race issues, political issues, infighting, Christians fighting. There's problems all around us. You say, is there hope? Yes, because Jesus came out of that grave. There's hope for your situation. You need a miracle, you've come to the right place. You need stability, you've come to the right place. You need a second chance. You say, Pastor, I'm a Christian, but I just kind of messed up. I've taken my eyes off the road, my faith. There was a guy who came to church on Good Friday and he was standing like right in this area. I, I thought he was looking to talk to me. So I went up to him and said, hey, nice to meet you. And he kind of like, like, who are you? So I just punched him. I'm like, come on, man, I, we just did Good Friday. No, I'm just joking. But he went to talk to somebody up on the platform or something. But then he turned around within like 30 seconds. He grabbed me by the shoulder. And I started getting real mad. I'm like, get off, man, get off. He goes, oh, you're the pastor? He goes, can I talk to you a second? Right here. He goes, can you pray for me? This is like my worst day of my whole life. On Good Friday. I said, yeah, I gave him my best prayer. God loves you on the worst day of your life. So many people are going through it. They're hurting. Even in like, you maybe like, I know about Jesus. I know my parents, maybe Catholic or Lutheran or whatever, but you've gone through it. All I can say is this, if we'll look to Jesus, he really is the author and perfecter of our faith. If we'll look to him, that's where we'll get strength. That's where we'll get healing. That's where we'll get direction for our life. Nothing else will make sense, but Jesus will make sense. And he says just to come follow me. If you're young, follow him while you're young. If you're old, don't give up on God, run to Jesus. Say, Jesus, do you still have something for me? The answer is yes. And there's a resurrection power. God can do by his spirit. The Old Testament prophet says, it's not by might nor by power. It's by his spirit. He can breathe life, hope, grace. You say, I don't want to keep going on like this in my spiritual life. I want to get stronger. I want to be a better follower of Jesus. Because he rose from the grave, God could do it. You say, I'm just not in a good spot right now. But on Easter Sunday, I believe God is going to send a move of his Holy Spirit to glorify his name, give you life purpose. He might need to forgive you. I'm just telling you, God is on the move. He wants to touch your heart. He wants to touch your life. And if you'll just open yourself up, say, God, I don't know what you're doing. I'm just telling you, I'm standing before you. And I don't know what I'm doing. I haven't known what I'm doing for the last two years. But I think I'm in a better spot, no, not knowing what's going on, but just taking God at his word and obeying him and seeing the results. We're sitting here because of the goodness of God. There's problems all around. Tonight at five o'clock, I'm gonna go see my mom. She may, or not, she may or may not recognize me, but it's never about how good God is. God is good. He comes and gives comfort and gives grace. He's a good God. He's a faithful God, and you can trust him with your heart, your life, and your future. Would you stand with me in the Lord's presence? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, the Bible teaches us that we don't have to fear, just like on Easter Sunday, fear not. Jesus, our strength. Jesus, our focus. Jesus, our help. And maybe you've come here today, you say, Pastor, I don't have a relationship with God. I'm not sure if I would die, I would go to heaven. I've never even heard a message like this. Maybe you go to, like, to a different type of church, you watch online, you, you've never actually dealt with your own salvation and what would happen if you would die. God is bringing us into what's the most important thing, a meaningful relationship with God, but also the assurity of when we stand before him that we go to heaven. God doesn't want anyone to die. He came to save the day. There are problems, there is sin, there is death. Yeah, all around us, get used to it. This is how it is, this is the world. The world lies, it cheats, it's wrong, it doesn't have peace, it doesn't have joy. 
All we're hearing right now, I, I, I listen to these different pastors, they say this is the future. What you can guarantee is more instability. We're just gonna go from one problem to another problem. The war, the gas prices, Will Smith, probably shouldn't have said that. We just go to one thing, we go to another thing. That's what Americans do. We just bounce from one thing to another thing to another thing. And God says, you can't live that way. You have to stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our faith. He is the one who died on the cross. He is the one who resurrected. He is the one that's coming back. And when you put your faith in him, your sins are gone. You have a relationship with God. You fear not. You know without a doubt when your time is done, you go to heaven. Either Christ comes back the rapture or you go to be with the Lord. But it does take a step of faith to say, yes, Lord, I believe. And you invite him in and he begins to change you from the inside out. And if you need a change, maybe your heart convicts you of sin. You have to let Jesus come and say, Lord, I'm, I'm convicted right now. I can't live with this lack of peace. Some of you might have thought about suicide yesterday, today. You're so miserable on the inside. You might have dressed up looking good or whatever, but on the inside, you need a change. Sin has to be dealt with. Let Jesus wash you of your sin, cleanse you, make you whole, become a child of the living God. He'll do that for you. He'll forgive you. But maybe for the majority of us in this room, the Lord is saying, keep following me, trust me, walk by faith and see what I do. In these last days, God says he's gonna pour out his spirit. And if you need God to do a miracle, resurrection power is available. You let him touch your heart, touch your life. You need a miracle, you've come to the right place. I'm not playing like Christian Monopoly, go there, do that. I'm saying, no God, all we have is you. All we have is your power. All we have is your presence. Lord, you can do it. You came out of the grave, you can heal people. You can bless people. God, your people know what you need. Even Lord, you know what they need. They're gonna put their faith and that's when miracles happen. He's so faithful. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. And he responds to people when they call on his name. You ask me how I know, he works, he lives in my heart. He's been faithful, he's been good, and he wants to prove faithful to you today. So this is what I invite you to do. If you wanna ask Jesus Christ to come into your life, you've never done that, or maybe you're backslidden, you're so far, you say, Pastor, I know better, and God is trying to bring me, today is a day of decision. You have to make that. Or you just need a miracle. You just need a miracle. You say, Pastor, it's like dead. It's, the hope is dead, it's not there. The marriage isn't there. The kid is not there. The job isn't there. The peace isn't there, whatever. And you wanna come around this altar and we're gonna believe that God will take something that seems to be dead and break it alive again because he lives. His resurrection power can do the impossible. And you need a miracle. You need encouragement. You need his grace. I'm telling you, God is faithful. We're gonna pray. We don't have a lot of room at the altar, but if we can kind of go around here, we're gonna sing that little song, Because He Lives. And you need a miracle in your life. You need salvation or you just need a miracle. You've come to the right spot, right place. I invite you to come around this altar and we're gonna close this down with a word of prayer. And we're gonna believe God for his presence and his power in Jesus' name. I can face tomorrow because he lives. And all fear is gone. You want to pray? You need a miracle? I invite you to come. Because I know. more time. Let's sing it together. He lives. We praise you, Lord. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives.
you, if you're a believer, would you just pray with me for salvation of people or the drawing of God's Spirit in our services today? But if you've come here today and you say, Pastor, I, I want to start following Jesus. I acknowledge my sin. I acknowledge that Jesus died on the cross because of me. And he loves me. And he went to the cross and he went into the grave. He resurrected for me to give me life and new life. And today is a day of life and hope. And today he wants to bring you salvation, forgiveness of sins, and a right relationship with God, peace with God. Even if you don't understand it, all I can say is sin is really bad. It had to be dealt with with death and a sacrifice with blood. And Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So you don't have to walk away the same way you came in. It's not just a mental belief. It's a, Lord, change my life. Make me more like you. I want to follow Jesus. I want to look and feel like Jesus. I want to live my life for the Lord. I'm choosing now, Lord, to walk away from lying and stealing and saying yes to the author and perfecter of the faith. And today you're here. Whether you're at the altar, you're online maybe, or you're you're in the chair, you didn't come, or you just want to renew your commitment to the Lord. You say, Pastor, I need to ask Jesus to come into my life. Today's my day. The Bible says today's a day of salvation. You want to get things right. You want the Lord's mercy and grace to be upon you. You want him to wrap his love of arms around you. You're, you're saying yes to his plan of salvation. It's the only way Jesus invites you into a meaningful relationship. You want to start following Jesus. Today's your day. Today's our day. Today is the day of resurrection. No one's looking around, but you say, that's me, Pastor. I want to give my life to Christ. If that's you, can I just see your hand? I want to pray for you. Today, you're giving your life to Christ. You say, I'm going to follow the Lord with all of my heart. Today's my day. Is there anyone else? There's two people, three people. Anyone, you want to give your life to Christ? I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. Is there anyone else? You want to say, I want to start following the Lord. You know, sometimes God uses pastors or Christian people to help us to pray couple men today. I believe God's calling men to take the lead and be strong and say, Lord, I'm going to give my life to Christ and move forward. Today's your day, but I'm going to invite everybody to pray. And if you men, you ask, you're asking the Lord to come, you make this your prayer. We're just doing it together because it's public, but you make this your salvation. Let Jesus wash you and cleanse you. Take that burden of sin off you and put his spirit inside of you. Can we pray together? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus. come on, let's pray together. Dear Jesus, we believe, we believe that you died, that you died and, rose again. and rose again. I invite you into my heart. Change me. Cleanse me. I repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. And start following you today. Following you today. With, all of my heart. With all of my heart. Today, today I, become a follower I become a follower of Christ. Of Christ. Thank, you, Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. For your salvation. My salvation. My salvation. Can we all just give God thanks for our salvation? Oh, Lord, we praise you. We praise you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you. Sometimes the lines are blurred when we're hurting. If you come here today, and a lot of people are, you've gone through a lot the last couple of years. Maybe you've brought some of it upon yourself. Maybe Satan's been running crazy or just the world's circumstances. You say, Pastor, I'm tired, I'm lonely, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. Like some people used to say, I'm so sick of tired. I'm so, I'm so sick of tired of being sick and tired. And you just need a renewal in your heart. So you just need God's presence and power. You say, I believe everything he's saying. Jesus died and rose. I believe everything. But I want God to move in my life. I want God to do a great work in my life. I want the power of God to be in my life. I just need a move of God. Maybe you are in a life change. Maybe you just retired. You say, I'm just believing God. Maybe you graduated from college. I'm believing God. I'm giving God my 20s. You're young married. I'm giving God. You're 12 years old. You're saying, God, I don't know what you want to do with my life, but here I am. Maybe you've had some issues. Or maybe God is prospering you like you've never thought before. You have more money than you know what to do with, and God's blessing you, which he is. You're saying, God, what do you want me to do with this? I suggest all of us put our eyes on Jesus. Follow Jesus. Let him heal you. Let him guide you. Let him give you wisdom and discernment. 
If you need God to touch your heart, touch your emotions, touch your thoughts, these last couple years, good, bad, or indifferent, you say, that's me, pastor, I just need God, and you want a prayer over your life, would you just lift up your hands right now and say, God, I need you, Heavenly Father, in this place. America, the world has gone through a very challenging time. People's lives in South Jersey and inner cities have gone through a very challenging time. Discouragement, isolation, loneliness, confusion, raising children, so much doubt. Faith has been on the back burner and God, you're lifting us to a place of obedience and trust and following you. And Lord, we take steps to say, God, come help us. Come bless us, come nurture us, keep, Lord, guide us. Let your word come deep into our hearts. Oh God, we need you. I pray, Lord, everybody online, they wanna be here, but they can't, bless them. Lord, I pray, God, they may feel like they're shut in, but don't let them feel like they're shut out. Lord, people that need a move of God, I pray, God, your grace, your new mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let there be a spiritual revival in America. Oh God, we need it. Our, our nation's in trouble. Start with me, start with us. Bless us, oh God. Let people know it's real. Let it be so real, more real than the money in their pocket. Oh God, bless them. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God. And then finally, let me just kind of give a little direction and we'll close with a prayer. I know what you're saying, another prayer? Yep, this is gonna be the best one. This last one's gonna be the best one. But this Wednesday, no United Prayer Service. As you know, that's our most important service of the week. But we wanna give all of our staff just a little time, give the building a rest, clean and all that stuff. It, I think for most schools, they're off this week or whatever, so no Wednesday night. And then number two, please sign up for a small group ASAP. They're gonna go pretty quick, but if you wanna get involved, there's two ways to get involved in a church, serve and or small groups. Small groups for May and June, I encourage you to be a part of it, get to know new people. If you're a regular, don't assume everybody knows you. You're gonna have to take the step and say, hey, nice to meet you, how'd you hear about us? If you're new, you may be so new, you might be one of the regular, most regular people moving forward because you just assume like, oh, this is what we do. That's what we do. We just get involved. We serve the Lord. We love the Lord. Let me pray God's blessing over your life. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for being with us at Easter. We are so excited that you were able to join and experience God this morning. Just a quick reminder, we are off United Prayer Service this week, but we'll be back the following week. We can't wait to see you next Sunday at church, whether you're in person or online. Later, skater.